Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? Most laptops are all about getting work done, but this one had an entirely different purpose. This is an OLPC XO released in November of 2007 by a nonprofit called One Laptop Per Child. Specifically, it's an XO1, the first production version, though it saw several revisions, which we'll get into a little later. As its name suggests, it was intended for use by children, so its enclosure was designed with durability in mind. A green rubber bumper surrounds the outside edge and the plastics are a bit sturdier than one would find on a typical laptop from the era. Most of the ports are hidden behind a pair of rotating covers. On the right side are two USB 2.0 ports, with another USB port and audio jacks on the left. Those covers also serve as a locking mechanism for the screen, as well as being the Wi-Fi antennas. Inside the machine is another sign of its intended audience, a rubber membrane keyboard meant to resist dirt and light spills. As you could probably imagine, this dramatically impacts its usability. Not only is it sized for smaller hands, but there is practically no key feel. It also tries to be multilingual, with a number of keys sporting alternate characters and a few are also dedicated for math or science functions, like this one for division and multiplication. In front of the keyboard is a touchpad made by Alps. It works well and completely unlike the keyboard, its two buttons have a satisfying clicky feel. On either side are additional areas originally planned for use with a stylus but they were never enabled in software, which is probably just as well, since the XO doesn't have a place to store a stylus on board. The right side of the screen bezel features a webcam and microphone, and beneath them are a set of action buttons. Likewise, there's a D-pad on the left side. Normally, these would be in an awkward spot to use, but instead, show off one of the XO's trick features. Its screen can swivel and fold to turn the device into an e-reader. The display itself is also special in order to facilitate this. In normal operation, it's a backlit 1200 by 900 resolution color screen, but with the brightness turned all the way down, it becomes a black and white transflective panel. It remains easily readable in normal light, but saves significant power. In later revisions of the hardware, e-reader mode would also cause the XO to shut down many system components when buttons weren't being pressed, leading to a decent increase in battery life. And as for that battery, this particular laptop came with a four cell lithium iron pack rated for 3100 milliamp hours. This gave an average battery life of only about three hours though, so a number of flexible options for charging were available, from simple wall wart AC adapters to solar panels and even hand cranks. Opening the screen and rotating at 90 degrees reveals the XO's last bit of expansion, an SD card slot hidden underneath the bezel. That area is also where taking the laptop apart begins, with two screws per side. It's nice to see that they use standard Phillips head screws that thread into metal inserts, since it's possible that over its lifetime in a school, an XO might need to be repaired more than once. From there, the display bezel simply lifts away to expose the LCD panel. It's held in with four rubber isolated screws to provide some shock protection and otherwise connects with a pair of flat flex ribbon cables. The motherboard is mounted to the back side of the display and another four screws need to come out so the cover can be removed. With the screen closed, it lifts up from the hinge side and slides back. The first component we're presented with is the Wi-Fi card. 
It sports a custom 802.11g chipset from Marvell, and early versions could also build a mesh network with other XOs to share an internet connection. But this was found to be buggy and dropped in later releases. The rest of the interesting chips are hidden under a simple EMI shield that also doubles as a heatsink for the CPU. And as for that CPU, the original XO laptops like this one were powered by an AMD Geode LX700. That chip is clocked at 433 MHz, and with a TDP of only 3.1 watts, that seemingly flimsy heatsink is actually up to the task. There's 1 GB of flash storage on board, along with 256 MB of RAM. Partly to make the best use of the relatively limited hardware, the XO runs a custom version of Fedora Linux with a graphical UI called Sugar. It includes a mix of educational and creative apps, along with a few games, and interestingly, easy terminal access to the Linux underpinnings. The software that shipped with the XO was open source, and seemingly a lot of effort went into localizing the UI for various languages. There are quite a few available to choose from. After hearing about the project, Steve Jobs had proposed to OLPC founder Nicholas Negroponte that the machine could run Apple's Mac OS X, but that never came to pass as Apple wasn't willing to fully commit to OLPC's open source requirement. But since the XO's Geode CPU was based on the x86 architecture, some clever users managed to get the machine to run Windows XP from an SD card. And that's not actually the only time Windows ran on the XO. During its development, just like with Mac OS X, Microsoft had pledged to offer its operating system to the project. And while Linux won out, some wider ranging effects were still had. The company's experience with the XO's limited hardware performance helped prepare it for the upcoming netbook trend. But netbooks were generally considered slow, and despite its Linux roots, so was the XO. It was also criticized for its repairability. While some components were straightforward to swap, they were also proprietary and not easy to come by. Other commonly broken parts, like the DC input jack, were soldered directly to the motherboard. Putting them on their own separate PCBs would have made repairs quicker and cheaper, but it also would have increased the XO's cost. And the cost was really the XO's limiting factor. With the One Laptop Per Child's project launch in 2005, a price target of $100 US was set for the machines. The hope was to make them affordable enough for developing countries to buy in large quantities and provide to school children. But the initial one-year timeline stretched on. Various companies pledged their support, but disagreements caused delays and turmoil. Ultimately, the X01 settled on a price of $200. Though it wasn't originally intended for direct sale to the public, a buy one, give one campaign was launched where for 400 bucks, you could get a machine for yourself while a second one would be donated. Over time, revisions to the XO were made to improve on its deficiencies. The XO 1.5 launched in 2010, and while it didn't bring dramatic battery life improvements, it switched to a 1 GHz via C7 processor, increased to 1 GB of RAM, and 4 GB of flash storage all helped its usability. In 2012, the next revision, called the XO 1.75, made the switch to an ARM-based CPU, which finally allowed the machine to offer a runtime of between 5 and 10 hours on a charge. The last model, the XO4, circled back to the touch input idea of the original XO laptop, but instead of a stylus area, it boasted a modern capacitive touchscreen. Ultimately, the OLPC project had good intentions, but poor planning, unrealistic expectations, and corporate backstabbing kept it from achieving its goals. 
Its story is so complex that an excellent book was even written about it. Unlike when the XO laptop launched, computers and tablets are now rather inexpensive. OLPC and its leaders had been very ambitious, claiming early on that they planned to make hundreds of millions of computers for children. It's been slow coming, and we're only making about 5,000 a week, but we hope, we hope, sometime in next year, maybe by the middle of the year, to hit a million a month. But in the end, total shipments of all models reached just about 3 million. That's still a sizable number, though, and despite its problems, the XO laptop still managed to make an impact. It didn't accomplish all of its lofty goals towards improving education, but no doubt at least some children benefited from using one. Computing has become more accessible than ever before, and perhaps a small part of that can be attributed to a little green laptop that tried to change the world. If you liked the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.